well, look at us. Five seconds in and we've connected with each other. Five seconds in and you're already judging me. No, it's all right. It's natural for you to do that. Because while you're paying careful attention to me, your brain is also processing all that information from your senses. So what you can see, what you can hear, and for the front row, what you can smell. All of that information is helping you to assess if I'm worthy of your attention. It's an unconscious process. Well, it was an unconscious process until I pointed out what was going on, and now it's conscious. And because it's conscious, I know what you're thinking. Because you can't hide it now. It's there in plain sight. There's a man in the fourth row who's thinking, she's a bit chirpy for this time in the morning. <laughs> There's a lady just behind him thinking, I wonder if she's getting paid for this. <laughs> and, yeah, the woman just behind her is going, I wouldn't have put that jacket with those shoes. <laughs> it's, it's what we do. It's how we've done it since we were about this high. Because our brains are hardwired to connect with other people. We're social beings. And that means that the more information we have, the easier it is to decide whether we want to connect with those people or not. And that means that our most successful interactions happen when we meet people face to face. Now this connection we've just made, you and me, that wouldn't have been nearly as effective if all I'd done is send you this message. Because we know that nonverbal communication is essential and yet, with the exception of video calls, we also know that we have to cope without it. So how do we compensate? How do we make every digital connection count? Well, the truth is, we can't. It's not going to be perfect every time, but what we can do is control the risk of making a mistake. Because communicating on digital media is essentially a risk management exercise. So what we need to do is remember that we reply within seconds. You know, and they garble our response by not thinking it through. That's not good. Because the speed at which we're able to connect with people, that ought to make it more effective, oughtn't it? But the fact is that misunderstandings are far more frequent than they were. And it's partly because we don't engage our filter. You know, the thing is, we perceive there to be less risk less of a threat when we're typing a message on our computer keyboard or on our mobile device. It's like, it's like shouting at other road users from the safety of the driving seat. I mean, you wouldn't normally yell random things at people in the street. <laughs> but these filters don't apply to some people when they're behind the wheel or when they're composing an angry tweet. And it's because they've created a safe distance between themselves and the person they're addressing. So the perceived threat is reduced. Now because we make, because we learn best by making mistakes, that's what's happening. None of us are perfect at communicating on digital formats yet. We're all novices. And from my work with people in all types of organisation, I know that most of us experience a communication cock up every single day. So what we have to do is understand how to use digital platforms to best effect and then get it right more often. Because we're even expected to learn a whole new language to express our emotional state. I mean, if you want to connect with anybody under the age of 30, you need to know how to use and interpret emojis. <laughs> now, I think I could have spent this entire talk explaining how to use those effectively, but I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not. Life's too short. And I think it's more interesting to talk about the science of behaviour. You know, the things that can help us understand how to connect with people in a digital world, because that is where psychology comes in. And I think our knowledge of good and bad interactions when we meet people face to face can tell us a lot about how to connect with people, you know, over the internet. So you think about the connections you've got with your family, your friends, even your co-workers. Now, the very best of those are based on mutual trust. And that is founded on a number of repeated, successful interactions. 
Because when things go to plan, we feel rewarded. Chemicals like dopamine are released in our brain. We feel good. So we behave in a certain way. And when we feel happy, we're motivated to maintain those connections. When we feel disappointed or let down or angry, we're far more likely to cut off those ties. And that's because our survival depends on our ability to recognise things that are good for us and then pursue them. But it also depends on our ability to recognise the things that are bad for us and run a mile. It's instinctive. So what we're aiming for is a feel-good factor every time we connect with somebody else. And I think that rather than relying on emojis to help us to do that, we can generate a sense of satisfaction and even trust simply by matching expectations. Because the need for familiarity, predictability, it's in our DNA. And when you match expectations, you can be more productive, helps you to build better relationships, but fundamentally helps you, it means that you can be trusted. Let's look at online shopping as an example. I mean, if you order that, you want to receive that, right? You don't want to receive that, that, or actually even that. Because when things don't match our expectations, it feels really uncomfortable. Because we have to expend unnecessary energy in our brain figuring out what happened. It's almost as if our brain hurts. Now let me show you what I mean with this. You've all seen one of these. It's a Rubik's Cube. Now, I know three ways of doing this. The first way is to peel off all the stuff. <laughs> You've done that, haven't you? The second way is to move the bits, like it shows you in the instructions. And the third way, which is the way I like best, is just to throw it in the air. <laughs> and it's done, you see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, unless you were expecting me to solve that by throwing it in the air, that will have come as a bit of a shock to most of you. <laughs> now you're all desperately trying to figure out how I did it. <laughs> yes, your mind is in overdrive. The same thing happens when someone doesn't match your expectations in a written communication. <coughs> they do something you weren't expecting, or that more likely they don't say something you were expecting and it doesn't feel good, and it's going to affect your opinion of them and how you behave with them from that point forward. And I know that because when I just solved that Rubik's Cube, the surge of chemicals in your brain prompted a physiological change. It did. Your heart rate might have increased. Your pupils probably dilated. You might have even clenched your buttocks. <laughs> how do I know all of that? because we've put vibration sensors in all the seats. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but you checked, didn't you? Because what I said didn't match your expectations. So neurotransmitters whizzing around in your brain prompted you to check to see if the senses were there or not. You can't control it. It's instinctive. But I actually do know that's what happened. Because I recently worked with a company who'd done extensive research in car dealerships. What we were able to do was put heart monitors on genuine customers and then monitor them through the sales process. And what we found was when things didn't match their expectations, so say for example they'd booked a test drive with a manual car and when they got there the salesperson said, you're going to have to drive an automatic because that's all we've got in that model, their heart rate went through the roof. And the more we found out about these mismatches and expectations with these customers, we found the more likely they were to leave without having bought a car or even having booked a repeat visit. Even when they said, I'm coming today, I'm desperate, I need a car. So now all the sales staff are trained in how to, among other things, match customer expectations. And they're selling more cars. But we wouldn't have got that information from the customer if we'd asked them when they left. We know that because we did ask them. And what they said, the reason for them to leave that dealership that day was, I don't know, it just didn't feel right. It just felt a bit uncomfortable. So, 
we know that we can't actually pinpoint why we feel like that. And we know that because it's an unconscious process. And we found that out by scanning people's brains when they experience a mismatch in expectations. And what we found was that these areas light up because of the increased activity. And these are the areas of the brain that deal with stress and fear. So that's why it's so important to avoid these mismatches and expectations. Because smooth interactions in our brain mean that we feel more comfortable and at ease more often. So how's all this information going to translate to your day-to-day -day lives? How on earth is this going to help you connect with people more effectively? Well, I'm guessing that you're expecting to leave with some advice on how to do that. So I'm going to finish by giving you my top three tips on how to communicate effectively in a digital world. Okay, firstly, the key to matching expectations is to do what you said you'd do. <laughs> I know, sounds simple, doesn't it? Really straightforward. But this is definitely something that individuals and businesses find really hard to grasp. <laughs> and now you know what happens to you physically when you experience a mismatch, you're going to find it really hard to ignore. So what you need to do is make sure that you manage your own expectations and the expectations of other people responsibly. So if you need to change a deadline or an appointment, do it. But let people know so they expect what's happening. If someone is making unreasonable demands on you, tell them so that you can match their expectations. The crucial thing is to avoid surprises. To make sure that every connection you have is based on knowing what's expected and then doing it. Okay, secondly, if you want people to associate you with nice glowy feelings and that sense of reward, then be liberal with your compliments. Yeah, because if you can do that, then when they connect with you, their dopamine pathways are going to glow a little bit brighter. For interest's sake, I, I just conducted a mini experiment over the last couple of weeks on Twitter. I sent a bunch of celebrities and famous people this tweet, asking them to connect with me. It contained one compliment. I got nothing. No responses, not even from the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so, I sent another bunch of celebrities and, you know, famous people this tweet. It contained three compliments. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all the responses and the replies I got, but one stands out for me because it's a particular favourite, and it's from Miranda Hart. Now, it's a favourite of mine because she points out that she hates social media and still took time to wish me luck for today. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Thank you, Miranda. But, well, well, the only thing I can conclude from this, let's face it, unscientific experiment is that three compliments are probably better than one. But you have to remember that we have an inbuilt radar for insincere compliments. So if you're going to do this, every time you do this, make sure it's genuine and it's sincere. Practice on me if you like. <laughs> Tweet me a message. Okay, thirdly, finally, not yet. <laughs> finally. There's three tips, remember? Keep up. So, Finally, you have to treat every text-based communication as you would a face-to-face -face conversation. Okay, don't write anything you wouldn't be prepared to say if the person was standing right in front of you. Engage your filter. Okay, and if someone sends you a message and needs a response, give it to them. Normal turn-taking, you know, that applies, as it would if you were standing in front of them. Don't leave people waiting for a reply even if it's just to acknowledge that you've got their message. Okay, it's just rude not to do that. And when you do make mistakes, which you will, remember to include this emoji <laughs> or this emoji with any apology you send to anybody under the age of 30. Okay, you're going to have to figure out for yourself what works and what doesn't work in your own network of people. But what I know for certain, for sure,
is that we can create great connections wherever they take place by managing our own expectations and the expectations of other people. Because when you do what you say you're going to do, people will associate you with good times. They'll feel good around you. And when they interact with you, their brain and their body will be in a happy place. Which is exactly how I'm feeling now, because I've really enjoyed interacting with all of you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you.